So we have a situation where there is a bias towards the largest party in provincial legislatures. And the modeling I have done shows that in a province like Gauteng, it is quite possible that even with the ANC not gaining an outright majority of votes, as most people seem to, to, to feel, that the ANC could well gain a two-seat bonus. In other words, their share of the seats will be two higher than their relative share of the votes. Legislation before Parliament is proposing to change South Africa's electoral system. The Electoral Amendment Bill is currently making its way through the various committees of Parliament, but there are some significant problems with it. Joining me to discuss is Michael Atkins. He is an independent analyst and an IT professional, but somebody who has a very strong interest in elections and who often applies his mind to the data around South Africa's electoral politics. Michael Atkins, welcome to the Solutions Podcast. Hi, David. Thank you. So, Michael, I wanted to, first of all, go into your background. How is it that you became interested in electoral politics and the data around South African politics? Well, I have been an election candidate before. I have counted votes in an election. I have been an independent observer. And through all the process, I found that the process of elections and the data and the results and the numbers tended to interest and motivate me more than the politics of the day. Electoral integrity is something that uh, is a, a generational and multi-generational uh, sort of importance for any country. And so I've been working on a project for many years to examine the accuracy of election results and find ways to improve on those electoral processes and the validation of results. And I also understand that you used to be a mathematics teacher, is that correct? Many years ago, but I've never lost my love of mathematics and numbers and, and the concepts around that. Well, mathematics wasn't my strongest subject in high school, but hopefully we can get by in this conversation and delve into some of the, the numbers and the potential scenarios. But let's uh, focus on this electoral amendment bill, first of all. So there was this constitutional court challenge in 2020 was when the judgment was handed down effectively sure. saying that we need to amend the Electoral Act to take into account representation of individuals, uh, individual candidates. South Africa has a proportional representation system, which means that it is parties that you vote for on the ballot paper. But could you take us through what is being proposed in some of the historical context to uh, this Concord judgment? Well, even before the judgment, we've had talk of electoral reform for some time. We had the Fincel Slubbett Commission that uh, reported back in 2003 proposing a mixed constituency PR system, which would be uh, compliant with our constitution. And it seems that this was the intent of those who negotiated the constitution, that the 1999 election was always intended to be a once-off and a springboard for a new system that caters for the richness and diversity of South African society. But there has been no movement on this. And when the individuals and organizations involved in that court challenge took up the cudgels in terms of section 18 and 19 of the constitution being the right to freedom of association, the right to free and fair elections, the court was forced to grapple with it from perhaps an unexpected uh, direction but it has led to the point where we have to consider a new electoral system. Of course, this is a slightly unusual situation for any country considering a change in, in election system, because we can't stay as we are. We can't just go back or remain as we have been. We have to move forward. And yes, the judgment said individuals have the right to stand for election, not merely at local government level, but at provincial legislature or national assembly level. Okay, so obviously there is this constitutional principle of proportionality. Uh, let's delve into some of the specifics here. Um, there are these nine multi-member constituencies that are being proposed. Uh, those kind of roughly correlate Correct. with the, the current provincial structure. 
Uh, what is the intention with those? What is the desired outcome in terms of the, the legislation? A system that was adopted by the minister and with which led to the drafting of the, the current bill aimed, it called itself a minimalist uh, solution or option. It aimed to simply incorporate individuals on the same ballot as political parties. And as we talk through this, we'll see that that becomes a major problem. But it was realized that simply to have a single national ballot for the National Assembly covering the entire country where we could have independent candidates and parties would become extraordinarily unwieldy. Uh, in 2014, we had 32 parties on the ballot. In 2019, we had 48 parties on the ballot. If we were then through the whole country to add another 50, if it is only 50, independent candidates, the ballots and the whole process of voting becomes unwieldy. So the nine regions, these multi-member constituencies, which again, I'll explain later is a, is a misnomer to an extent, uh, came about because it was realized that there wasn't a way to have a ballot for the whole country with every single independent candidate. Now, what most people don't realize is the electoral system has an existing provision which aims to distribute 200 of the seats of the National Assembly, irrespective of party affiliation, geographically around the country. So there is a system, everyone currently votes for the National Assembly, all the votes get totaled up, the parties get their number of seats allocated. And then afterwards, behind the scenes in the existing system, there is a way of taking 200 of those seats, taking those same ballots per region, being provinces, working out an allocation within each region, and then allocating those to parties. And what that means is, 200 of our MPs are distributed geographically around the country in rough proportion to the sizes of the provinces from which they come. Uh, again, most people are perhaps not aware, but members of the National Assembly, members of Parliament, do actually have constituency offices where they are based. And I think perhaps these do not get much prominence. We, we don't know how effective they are in all cases. But that was the intent. So the uh, sort of notional idea that this was a minimalist change to the existing legislation was that the independent candidates could be accommodated, as it were, on the behind-the-scene calculation for 200 of the seats for the National Assembly broken down by region. Now, according to the existing breakdown, that would mean, for example, the Northern Cape would have five of the 200. KwaZulu-Natal would have 41, Gauteng would have 48 of the, the those 200 seats. And in each of those regions, then independent candidates can contest and participate in a, a, a sort of a, a smaller uh, proportional election alongside the parties. Okay, and I mean, what, what do you make of this as a, as a potential proposal? I mean, do you, what are the shortcomings there? There have been some changes from the original uh, draft of the bill. In particular, the IEC has said that it is necessary from uh, the constitutional requirement of proportionality that the ballots for the National Assembly be separated into two ballots, one being a proportional ballot on which only parties occur, and the other being a, a call it constituency or regional ballot which would still be electing members of the National Assembly, but only from one of those provinces or regions. The parties would still be represented on that ballot, but the independent candidates would then stand as individuals. Now, this is, logically speaking, a it is a constituency system, what is termed a multi-member constituency, as you referred to. But realistically speaking, there is no system anywhere in the world where a whole province with 40 odd members would be a single constituency. This has no inherent meaning or uh, intuitive understanding among the electorate. 
around the country, around the world, you have constituency systems which are single member, a district with one MP, or in some elections, for example, the European Parliament elections, you have districts that elect between three and seven members. Other countries also implement that form of district. And this doesn't satisfy any of the criteria. On a very superficial level, yes, these are constituencies. Practically speaking, it has very little meaning as a constituency. But it does assist with the proportionality problems, which um, we can go into as we talk. But it, it is an uncomfortable compromise to try and get through a system, it's seemingly to try and get through a system that could be implemented quickly. Although we say quickly, it, it has taken us some time to get to this point. All right. So there is this constitutional principle of proportionality, which overrides or, or infuses all of the, the various mechanics of the electoral system. Yes. Um, in your view, is this current bill consistent with that principle of proportionality? And if not, why not? Right. The National Assembly has become more proportional. In essence, if I can describe the proportionality principle and problem that we're faced with, we can then see how the bill uh, falls short in, in critical areas. Okay. Essentially, if you have a single ballot and you have individuals and parties on that ballot, what happens is you allocate seats to individuals, to your independent candidates, but obviously they may only occupy a single seat, even if they win enough votes that would ordinarily merit a few seats. And what happens is any seats earned by individuals get allocated to those individuals and their seats and votes are removed from the calculations before the proportional calculations for parties are carried out. And if I may take a slight sideways movement, the way proportional allocations work, you have so many votes, 17.4 million votes, 400 seats, that gives you an effective quota per seat, 43, 44,000 votes per seat. And when seats are allocated, you say, well, who's got 44,000 votes or more? Give them a seat for each 44,000 votes. That is the quota. But then after all the seats are allocated according to the quotas, there are a certain number of seats left over, and each party has a certain number of votes left over. Those are the remainders. So what happens in 2019, we had 48 parties and 13 of the 400 seats weren't allocated by quotas because the remainders of those 48 parties effectively added up to 13 seats worth of votes. So you allocate seats first on quota and then on remainder. I won't get into the particulars now. But when you have individuals on that, that list, you first, you have to have a stage where you allocate seats to individuals, those, those independents. You then remove, effectively remove those seats that are awarded and the votes that go towards individuals. Now, the way these numbers break down, automatically, if you take the collective independents as though they were a party, but they're not, all of the independents together, all of the votes they have, and any seats they win. Now, when you remove those successful independent candidates, their votes and seats, they are going to have more votes, relatively speaking, than the number of seats that they are awarded. So you get a prominent person, uh, a celebrity, might get two or three seats worth of votes. When you take those out of the calculation, you're taking three seats votes out of the calculation and you're taking one seat so the votes and seats for independence are out of proportion when you remove them from the calculations what's left is also out of proportion and what it means is the collective share of seats for parties is a little higher than their share of the votes so essentially mm -hmm. parties are going to earn a higher proportion of seats than the vote share that they enjoy. And the way the calculations work, the largest party is always going to get the biggest gain. So roughly speaking, but it's slightly biased above this, if there are excess seats that the independents don't take up, independents might get 
5% of the votes, which would ordinarily be 20 seats, but they may only get six seats. So there is a bonus being given back to everybody else. And that bonus is being shared out firstly to the largest party and thereafter among the others. Some, some of the smaller parties might not get any increase in seats from that bonus. Why would so that necessarily go to the largest party? Those excess you see, votes? When you when you take the seats and votes for independent candidates out of the calculation, you drop the quota. The quota, another way of thinking about it, is the cost of each seat that has already been awarded. So if you drop the quota, the each seat for parties costs fewer votes. If a seat costs fewer votes, the largest party gets a big bonus because mm. the, if the ANC has close to 200 seats, each seat becoming cheaper adds up to several seats as a bonus. If you were to take, say, 4% of all the seats given back to share among the parties, a 4% bump for the ANC is close to uh, eight or nine seats at that level if they're around 50% of the vote. Whereas a 4% bump for a small party actually probably wouldn't change the number of seats that they get allocated. So those extra seats that go to the parties, because independents inherently cannot win collectively as many seats as the votes they earn, uh, those extra seats will go in greater proportion to the largest party. And then we you see we, we have this one large party in the National Assembly and then less than half at the moment you, and then is, is the DA is second, and then almost half of them is the EFF. So if you have eight or 10 bonus seats, as it were, awarded to the parties, the ANC is going to get five or six of those seats, uh, very, you know, very simply. And this is after the improvements to the bill have been made. Uh, even the second uh, ballot that's been allocated ameliorates the problem to some extent, but not fully. There's a mental model called Hanlon's razor, which states that you shouldn't attribute to malice that's, that which can be explained uh, by incompetence. Uh, where do you think uh, this bull falls on that spectrum? Do you think that this is some nefarious plot by the ANC to covertly grow its share of parliamentary seats? Or do you think that this is just a, a kind of a muddle through uh, without consideration to the, the second order effects? Speculation is always dangerous. Um, given the timing and given the fact that it took nine months, more or less, for the Ministerial Advisory Committee to be constituted and start meeting, uh, by the time this was being done and the minister was making choices, he had very little option left. Uh, the minister was also warned immediately after the uh, Concord judgment in 2020 that if they wanted a full-blown constituency system, effectively that had to be in place by the end of 2021. And we were nowhere near ready at that point to make a decision. So by default, it's landed up like this. So on the minister's part, he took the assurances of the experts' who were on his panel, that this was a viable system. Now, the, the people who, who put forward this proposal, bearing in mind there was no sub public submission to this extent, and there is no precedent anywhere in the world for this system, but the three people who proposed this in that ministerial advisory committee were Norman Duplessis, former deputy CEO of the IEC, but also one of the architects of the entire electoral system during the 1990s followed, uh, accompanied by Mike Sutcliffe, former head of the Municipal Demarcation Board, and Pansy Klikula, former chair of the IEC. One could not on paper have hoped to assemble a more qualified and expert panel of people to advise on an electoral system. And I have to say, I'm making the assertion that this proportionality problem is fundamental it is predictable from the outset, and it is inherent to the design. Now, your question on motive, it is very difficult to speculate. I would say that uh, 
I don't use the word incompetence, but maybe lack of care, lack of attention to detail is as damning an indictment as would be malice in this situation. The, to my mind, there are no easy explanations other than here's a quick, convenient way, but let's not apply our minds too, too much to the details. Yeah, and in some ways, technical experts who are very close to their subject matter can sometimes fail to see the forest for the trees and get too caught up in the convoluted technicalities and kind of forget that an electoral system should be clear, it should be transparent, uh, it should be easily explainable to the electorate. Mm. And my worry here is that it becomes so opaque uh, that uh, it, it turns people off the democratic process, that they feel, oh, well, this this whole system is, is, is just rigged and uh, it, it benefits the, the incumbents. Uh, do you think that I, there's a risk of that or am I overstating it? I, I'm not put off by the opaqueness. Uh, if, if I may use a cricket analogy, the, the cricketing public very happily adopted the Duckworth-Lewis method of uh, calculation. There'd been many unhappy uh, scenarios with uh, the resolution of one-day international matches. And that is a black box. It's a black box that relies on statistics and very thorough detailed modeling. So providing there is, in a sense, transparency in the design and that the experts do model and understand the electoral system, having it being slightly opaque to the public is not a, is not a dreadful problem. I, I, I don't intend to be disrespectful, but there are not many people who do pay attention to the actual details of the seat allocation processes. Uh, and and why, for example, in 2014, Achang got two seats in parliament with 51,000 votes, because there is a mechanism uh, apart from the highest average to allocate remainder, I mean, highest remainder to allocate those remainder seats. There is a secondary mechanism after the first five uh, known as the highest average. And so there are some details in the existing system that are fairly opaque. Uh, so that I don't see in itself as a major obstacle, but why we would have constituencies as whole provinces, that there's no good reason from the public's perspective for that. That has no particular meaning. Okay, well, let's put aside this motive question for a moment and yes. let's just play this, this uh, out in terms of various scenarios. Yes. So we're now recording in August 2022. The next election should be in about May 2024. Uh, but there are some significant milestones that haven't been achieved yet. We seem to be quite far behind it in this process. Is there a risk that there's still a great degree of uncertainty looming over the electoral system as we approach the 2024 elections? And what would be the implications of that? In terms of the analysis of the bill, fundamentally, that proportionality question hasn't gone away. It has been lessened with the amendments to the bill. Uh, there is and I have a reason for mentioning the, the problems with the bill because these are critical to what happens after now and for that 2024 election. Uh, another problem with the bill is because only 200 seats are available for allocation among independent candidates with the full complement of voters, that in effect, the threshold of votes required per seat in the National Assembly for independent candidates comes out largely around twice as many votes as parties. To be sure of the seats in the National Assembly, independent candidates in their respective regions are going to need between 70 and 90,000 votes. In particular, if you have two credible independent candidates within a region, certainly the second or maybe the third credible candidate is going to need that 70, 80, 90,000 votes to be elected whereas parties only effectively need 45,000 votes to guarantee a seat in the National Assembly. That threshold, in my view, will inherently uh, prove to be a constitutional question in terms of free elections uh, uh, or fair elections, should I say. There are also still proportionality concerns in the provincial legislatures because it has been impossible to amend the bill to involve, uh, to create like a second ballot or sub-regions of provincial legislatures. Uh, 
And from a demarcation point of view, that is now impossible ahead of 2024. So we have a situation where there is a bias towards the largest party in provincial legislatures. And the modeling I have done shows that in a province like Gauteng, it is quite possible that even with the ANC not gaining an outright majority of votes, as most people seem to, to, to feel, that the ANC could well gain a two-seat bonus. In other words, their share of the seats will be too higher than their relative share of the votes. So if you took a scenario that the ANC had a, a vote share equivalent to 33 of the 73 seats, they are going to get on the current system 35 um, seats in, in the legislature on, on a, a, a vote share of equivalent to 33 seats. And does your model um, look at the national level as well? What, how right. might that play out in the national assembly? At, at the national assembly, there is one, the, the second ballot improves that. It doesn't deal with that threshold problem, which is a, a an equality before the law and a fair election problem rather than a proportionality problem. The calculation of the overall PR totals where both ballots are included, which does happen at local government, but that contributes to a six to eight seat bonus, depending on the level of overall level of support for independent candidates, uh, up to a six or eight seat bonus for the largest party, which could become quite a touchy subject if they are anywhere in the region of that 50% threshold. And that could expose the electoral outcome to some kind of legal challenge post-2024, right. right? I mean, that could uh, delegitimize yes. the, the, the the elections. The nightmare scenario. There, there are two nightmare scenarios facing us, and I don't think we're there yet. I don't think it will come to that. But one nightmare scenario is that the election results is challenged post-election. Obviously, the Constitution provides for it, but in terms of national cohesion, stability, the uncertainty surrounding it, uh, I wouldn't like to raise the specter that has happened in other countries like Kenya back in 2007. And, uh, you know, one or two other countries have had major unrest and loss of life following disputed elections. So that is a nightmare scenario that we don't want. Having said that, it is my very considered view that the constitutional shortcomings of the bill as it stands can be articulated now. And I would be extremely surprised if there is no constitutional challenge after the bill is signed. This cannot really happen prior to the bill being signed, mm. but come the end of September, if we believe one promise or early December, that bill gets signed. Yes, there is a very strong likelihood of a constitutional challenge from potentially a variety of civil society bodies. When you say signed, do you mean signed by the president or just Signed by through? the president. Okay. So, uh, so the, the, obviously, if we take the progression from now, it's in committee. The committee are working furiously at the moment to try and resolve outstanding questions. Uh, I presume that the plan is to present to the National Assembly for debate and voting during August. So we're, we're there. I presume it would then go to the National Council of Provinces during September. Now, there is one very interesting question in terms of timing and procedure and legality, because when the Speaker applied for the extension of six months to the deadline that expired in June, the Speaker gave two reasons for the extension of the deadline. One was for deliberation on the bill, which is underway at present. The second was for additional public consultation. Now, that can happen. It's not required normally by the National Council of Provinces, but there can be another round of public consultation by the National Council of Provinces. Mm -hmm. If the end of September deadline was to be believed, which was the statement issued by Parliament on the 10th of June, then there is no possibility of that promised public consultation. So you'd have the interesting situation is, was this... Did the speaker mislead the, the court? Which is a side note, but it is an uncomfortable point to, to contemplate. But if we take December as the president signs the bill and it becomes law, 
We then perhaps have a timeline where early in 2023, uh, a coalition of uh, civil society bodies take this to the Constitutional Court. I wouldn't like to presume how long it would take. Uh, there would certainly be an exchange of affidavits between the various parties. This may perhaps be heard in April, or this is pure speculation, um, and perhaps we would have a ruling in July or August next year. The final deadline for elections would be August, given the three months after the five years elapses in 2024. So there would be time. But there is no time if the constitutional challenge is upheld to put in place a new constitutionally viable act. There is no time. So then the court has a very difficult situation. And I would argue we're already at the first mini constitutional crisis. If the claims of unconstitutionality are valid, we actually now have no way to hold a constitutionally valid election in 2024. There will be a compromise on constitutionality in one form or another if that central claim around the thresholds and the proportionality uh, is upheld. So either the court orders that we revert to the old system, they suspend the order of invalidity for a further period covering that election, which would be a deeply uh, unsatisfying scenario. You know, one would generally want to progressively advance rights which are recognized by the court. But the compromise position would be that there is disproportionality or unfairness towards independent candidates in those uh, elections if the, the new system is tolerated for a single election. And any such arrangement by the court would have to leave it watertight, that there can be no challenge to the fairness of the, the election after the fact. So I don't know how the court would rule it. It is a speculation that would be too dangerous to make. But we have this uncomfortable position. The second nightmare scenario would also be that a challenge to the bill only arises in the second half of 2023. And the court rules early in 2024 when the election timetable is about to start. If the court were to then rule that uh, the the new the new bill was the new act was unconstitutional, the election process would already be underway. And in fact, uh, I think I may describe the IEC commissioners. Uh, if this is not disrespectful, as already suffering from PTSD from the constitutional challenges last year and the timing of the election and the extensions of deadlines and the process, it is certainly fairly clear that they do not want a rerun of any scary constitutional challenge where there are problems with the timing. Yeah, and, and I don't think that the IEC covered itself in glory ahead of those November 2021 elections. I mean, you know, the, the kind of muddled approach also meant that there was only one registration weekend that resulted in much lower uh, number of registered registered voters, lower turnouts, yeah. um, and in many ways they, they dropped the ball there. Um, so, you know, also there was this question of uh, when the ANC missed the, yes. the registration deadlines and then and they said, no, you can have an extension to your window. It seemed to be, you know, uh, favorable treatment towards the ANC there. So, you know, I think the public was would have been uh, justified in questioning uh, the integrity of the IC there, or at the very least, the competence. To be fair to the IC, and I, I wouldn't like to offer comment on that matter at, at this point. Mm. To be fair to the IEC, the Constitutional Court upheld their, um, their view on the, the registration. I found the reasoning to be a little thin, but we are where we are now. Certainly, I think in the end, the IEC, having dropped the ball, were able to scoop it up centimeters from the ground. And in my view, they rescued the elections with possibly a lot more panic than they would like the public to realize. There were many respects where 
that election was a close run thing in terms of the logistics and some of the processes, but they did pull it off. So, um, you know, I, I do give credit for the IEC for having made it happen under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. But they have a new problem. We get the bill signed in December, so we have an act in December. The IEC will be bound to start producing new systems, new systems for their ballots, new systems for registration of candidates. The, the calculation spreadsheets are not so terribly complicated. And fortunately, the voting will be largely the same, except there is the extra ballot. Now, if we get a ruling in July, August next year, you would have seven or eight months of development of a new system, which potentially has to get thrown out of the window. And that is a, 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 a very painful, uncomfortable scenario for the IEC to consider. Obviously, those new systems would not be live or uh, in the IT game, we would call it in production. The existing systems would be in place and it would always be possible to revert to the existing systems. But in my view, we are already going to have some very uncomfortable lines of argument in the Constitutional Court next year in terms of what to do with any unconstitutionality that uh, is is ruled on in, in the case that would seem to be likely. Yeah, and it's quite foreseeable that there will be delays as the bill makes its way through Parliament. And just to clarify, it's the Home Affairs Committee that is currently correct. Reviewing. And the minister you referred to earlier, was that the Home Affairs Minister? That's correct, Minister Mozzoletti. Okay. All right, well, this is the Solutions Podcast. So I think we've framed the problems very well and raised a number of red flags. But how do we find our way through this mess that has uh, somehow been created? I, I have a view that when you have a serious problem, you are always best addressing the nub of the problem as early as possible, regardless of how uncomfortable that fact is. In the long run, you are always better tackling the heart of the problem early. The heart of the problem is that you cannot have individuals on the same ballot as parties in a system that has to be proportional representation in the overall sense. The only possible way to include individuals is to have some form of constituency system in a hybrid with proportional representation. So very much along the lines of our local government elections, there is a fault, the, the counting of ward and PR ballots for the PR totals is actually problematic. And I have a somewhat view, an eccentric view that this is itself unconstitutional, but that's a topic for another day. So we need, the solution is some form of constituency combined with overall balancing PR. There are two basic constituency models on the table. One is the single member constituency, and indeed the ministerial advisory committee, the majority uh, led by Vali Musa, who, who was a very well qualified person to lead that process, came up with a proposal of 200 single member constituencies balanced by 200 seats, which uh, would give the proportionality, but that the two ballots would not count together for the overall PR total. What you then have is you have individual constituencies and parties not needing to contest every single constituency. If you have no support in an area, you're not obliged to put up a candidate to try and harvest the PR section of those votes. You then have very realistic constituency elections with maybe four or five or six or seven candidates in a constituency. And it then becomes may the best man win if you have a single member constituency. The other model used in certain parts of Europe and elsewhere is what's known as the multi-member constituency. You have a larger district of maybe five, 600,000 voters that elects four or five or six MPs in a mini proportional uh, election. But to, to satisfy the constitutional requirement of proportionality, which is an unusual one in world electoral systems to have this overarching proportionality requirement, you essentially need 
two ballots for the National Assembly, PR for parties only and separate constituencies, and then two ballots for your provincial legislatures, which are also one for PR and one for constituencies. You would then want to align the constituencies to make them the same between the uh, provincial legislatures and the, the National Assembly. You would want the same geographic boundaries. That is a slightly complex problem, but it is a solvable one. There'd be a few numeric adjustments, but the modeling for that is not excessively difficult. Our problem is this is not achievable in time for the 2024 elections. So there is going to have to be some form of order saying 2024 will happen according to a system that is not constitutionally acceptable. And I outlined the options earlier, either under the old system or under the current new system uh, there might be ways it can be improved and tweaked to minimize the distortion effects. But we need to start as soon as possible having a national debate about which constituency system will replace the old system we have, replace the bill that is before Parliament now with a more meaningful constituency system. It would also allow that conversation that's been ongoing for a long time of do we need electoral reform in order to change the political culture in the country? The court decision says nothing about political culture, and certainly the recommendations of the Zondo Commission are not binding in any sense. Those are reflections on things that have happened, and uh, Judge Zondo did reflect on the political system. What do you mean now by the political culture, Michael? A lot, many people bemoan the lack of accountability of the executive to parliament. So, for instance, the Zondo Commission recommended that there is a direct presidential election. Now, my view on that, that is a, that's a misplaced recommendation because, in theory, our executive should be accountable to parliament. One could, if one were to diagnose it, Perhaps the pure PR system is one reason why members of parliament do not hold the executive to account, because if you challenge the executive, it's easy to replace you. If you have a constituency system, in particular a single member constituency system, it is much more difficult to replace individual members of parliament who do the job of holding the executive to account. So, so you the, could have like rebel backbencher MPs who... Have Correct. a small constituency, but they they actually challenge the executive on its missteps. Correct. If the penalty for removing a member of parliament of your one of your constituency MPs is that you have to have a by-election, a there is the cost and logistics, but there could be a, a massive political cost to having to run a by-election. There might be slightly marginal seats. There could be tactical voting in a by-election. So. Members of parliament in a single member constituency system would be far freer to do that job of holding the executive to account. And we have the opportunity because, according to the analysis that I've tried to describe, you cannot have overall proportionality without a combined constituency PR hybrid system. We now have the opportunity to have those discussions about electoral reform and our political culture. And this is a situation we can maybe look at the process that was done this time around. The minister picked a solution himself. He picked a solution uh, advanced by three, uh, if I might say, uh, inside establishment insiders. And he put that forward for public consult. There was no choice put to the public. The only public consultation was over the details. How many signatures uh, should there be a deposit? There was no real, do we like this system or that system? If you look at consultation and public debate in any country where there will be a change of electoral system, there is always a debate between two options. And I'm saying that civil society needs to take up the cudgels and business and every interest group in society needs to take up the cudgels and say, right, when we solve the problem of our current bill, we then need to have an open, full public 
debate about what is the best replacement for what we have, taking into account both the court judgment and the, the, the calls for electoral reform and a change to our political culture. So, Michael, do you think that there's been sufficient public consultation on this piece of legislation? Most civil society bodies and indeed the Speaker of Parliament have actually said or acknowledged that there hasn't been sufficient consultation. Parliament went through the motions of accepting submissions, which they did correctly, written and oral submissions. They then did a, a rather hasty tour of the country, and there were many complaints about that. The management of that public consultation was poor, because often in many of those venues, you had 15 or 20 people reading the same script written by the same organization or party. But there is a fundamental level at which the public consultation was lacking. And this is that in terms of an electoral system, only one option was put to the public. We don't, as in other countries, have the option of saying, should we change to a new system? Uh, if you were to use an example like, should we have Brexit or not have Brexit, to use a controversial example, the public had a choice between two things. We don't have the choice of remaining on our existing system. So to consult on a, a, a system chosen by the minister and embodied in a bill without actually debating the merits of what is the best electoral system for the country I would argue in electoral terms, while it may have ticked the boxes of the public consultation for ordinary legislation, it certainly did not satisfy what would be understood anywhere in the world as being consultation over the best electoral system. And I take the view that the current bill cannot survive a constitutional challenge. And so if we were to rerun the process, I would argue that there has to be a public consultation between two forms of constituency system with the merits of each being debated, and they would be heated debates among different uh, sectors of society. Well, Michael Atkins, we often talk about active citizenship and ordinary South Africans going out and shaping the democratic uh, culture of the country. And I think you're an example of somebody who's doing that very thing. So wanted to thank you for keeping your eyes open and uh, doing the, the hard analysis. And uh, I wish you well in your efforts and certainly think that this is a very important issue that you flagged uh, for, for South Africa and, and our democratic system. Thank you, David. And I'm hoping that more and more people will come to see the importance of the electoral system and electoral processes as a... Uh, upholding the health of a democracy going into the future. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this a like and subscribe to the channel. Also leave your thoughts on this episode down in the comment section below. Let me know what you think of the format of this show and any topics that you'd like me to cover in the future. Similarly, if you are listening on your preferred podcast platform, please subscribe there as well. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.